Hello and welcome to Juvenalia. I'm Alan McGuire and co-hosting with me today is internet person Alan Tannum. Hi. Hello. And our guest today is a journalist and an author whose new young adult novel, The Making of Molly, is out October 17th. It's Anna Carey. Hello. Hey, how are you? Very well, thanks very much. What are you going to talk to us about today? I am going to talk about the girls' comics, British girls' comics that were hugely popular right up to the 90s and which I grew up with and what terrible effect this had on my <laughs> psyche being exposed to this insanity at a very early age like most of my generation so you were like a weekly reader of these or were, were they weekly first what, yes. are, what are the titles we're talking they about they were weekly now um, I mean my period of reading them was pretty much the entire 80s because um, <laughs> I was born in 1975 so I was we, we in our house because I've got three sisters so there was sort of a steady stream of them coming in you know even before I was old enough to yeah. really be into them and then after um, so they're the ones that were popular in my house were Judy the big three Judy Bunty and Mandy which are the ones that went on for ages but then there were some others like there was Tracy uh, there was this cool one they tried to launch in the late 80s called Nikki with oh, an I. Oh, nice. N-I-K-K-I. Oh, wow. Yeah. She sounds like Gala wears headbands. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. I don't know if there even was. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there was a personified Nikki because the rest of them all had, you know, there was, was there Mandy. one called Katie? My mom read that when she was young, but she was born in like, like 61 or something. Um, I don't remember that. And it wasn't going in the 70s because okay, they would have, been, have had annuals yeah. that you would have turned up at sales of work, which yeah. is where yeah. I encountered a lot of the uh, older, um, the older editions and then there was Tammy was another one that was published by the other big publisher and um, I think there there was a famous one which I never read because it was before my time but it's there's been a lot written about it was Misty which was uh, focused on sort of horror supernatural stories and that was in the 70s and uh, but aimed at like it was aimed tween. at slightly oh yeah. yeah like they were all aimed at sort of kids yeah. young t- you know 12 yeah. year olds yeah so it was tweens were the thing then it was either no, kids or teens the, so the, yeah. that linguistic abomination yeah. <laughs> <hasn't> been invented <laughs> yeah. but the, the market did mm-hmm. so um, I mean they were I, I think the thing is they were secretly read by a lot of other people because I know a lot of men my age who read them mm. When yeah, they were kids. It's like, like watching they, kids shows still and like in school and they would be like kind of frowned upon. But people would to watch still something like a year after everyone had been watching it. Yeah. Mm. You're just a tiny bit too old, but people read it anyway. Yeah. So yeah. everybody yeah. does. And the thing is with these with, with these comics, because they were so, so popular. Um I, I don't think I know anybody who didn't mm. read them. So mm. you'd start off with like Twinkle, which was for really little kids, or little girls, really. And then everybody, boys and girls, read like the Beano or the Dandy or Wizard and Chips. Mm. And, uh, and then you would possibly move on. Girls would often move on to the girls' comics and then boys would move on. There were lots of war comics and things mm. like Boy the Rovers, which was yeah. purple, obviously. And uh, they were just massive, like... You know, just on a level that, you know, very few, I don't, no print publications aimed at kids mm-hmm. does mm-hmm. anymore. They just had this enormous reach um, that uh, that is kind of hard to, to imagine now. It's weird, actually, because just when you said that there, you know about that, like the cliched headline about comics is like comics, not just for kids anymore. Yeah. Now there's no comics for kids anymore. Exactly. <laughs> I know. It's all it's like young adults. They're adult. all graphic novels. Yeah, yeah. If you're under 40, like there has not been, or maybe 35, like there mm. hasn't been, you know, you didn't grow up with comics as being mainstream. Like mm. they just weren't, um, they weren't in every shop, which they yeah. were then. And, and even by the late, early 90s, there were hardly any of them left. I think at that mm. stage, the early 90s, there was just Mandy and Judy combined to become Mandy and Judy and then M and J. Very <laughs> yeah. cool. And I think Bunty was, I don't know if Bunty was still... Bunty, Bunty was from, well, I looked it up and it was until 2001 and I remember reading it when I was like seven. So I would have been, that would have been like 98 or so so it was definitely still it was a thing but I think it folded I, rem- I remember yeah. buying like the last issue of it wow yeah and did it have at that stage was it still mostly stories or it was it all stories it was like a f- I think they did a bit few more they did more photo stories yeah about like a new boy coming to the yeah. town and yeah. he's the school principal's son or yeah and it's like but they still had like the like drawings like it was like the four Marys or Penny's Place 
Oh, Penny's Place. Yeah. yeah. And, um, Ariel Penny's was... Place start was Mandy and Judy. Okay. So and they amalgamated it. Yeah, they must have just... We're just chucking them all in one <laughs> thing now. So, so what was Penny's Place? Penny's Place was a cafe. <laughs> oh my God, what was the name of the town? And uh, it was like Penny was the daughter of the cafe owner. And she worked yeah. there. Yes. And she had a friend called Donna who... I Donna was tough. Donna was gay. Well, she was pretty gay. She looked really retrospect. gay. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, looked Donna, her up She had sort of an undercut. She did. Yeah. Yeah. She was pretty great. And she yeah, was, she like, was her... like she was from like a tough part of the town and like Yeah, but um, there was a lot of there was solidarity across the class lines in Penny's place. Which was, was very cool and like well, the socialist is... as hell. But, like, <laughs> the comics were often um like the, the class stuff about them is kinda of mad because there was a lot of stories set in orphanages and yeah. orphans and urchins and waifs. They had many names for them. Yeah. But, just... uh, Downtrodden kids. Yes. <laughs> well, that the downtrodden misfortunates. The, yes, yeah. a lot of misfortunates yeah. and a lot of people suffering for no reason through various uh, through, through like lots of bedridden little girls and stuff. <laughs> yeah, but also one of the things that is really mad about about girls comics at the time, and I mean this is going back to like the at least the sixties and seventies as well, is that there were loads of stories where people suffered for no reason. So. This is the perfect example, and it was, I found it really difficult to read when I was a kid. It was a story called Hard Hearted Harriet. And you can imagine, oh. it's not going to be fun. No. There was a lot of alliterative. There were a yeah. lot, yeah. A, a lot of alliterative <laughs> <laughs> legends. Like, I'm just opening a comic now, which I brought along with me from 1986. It's Judy and Tracy. Tracy had joined in before it got booted out. <laughs> um, in 1996. Tracy. Yeah, well. There's no hope for Tracy. The golden voice of Glenda. <laughs> um, that's just one alliterative one. Oh, there's a pun, Norma's Ark, set in the year 2384. Oh Ooh. So, yeah. Uh, the Hobbies of Holly. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a lot of alliteration, but in Hard Hearted Harriet, the premise was, so Victorian times, like a lot of these stories, mm -hmm. and she is an orphan. Well, also take it as red for most <laughs> yeah. of them and she has lots of different younger siblings but then she discovers that she is dying of some sort of unspecified wasting disease which happens a lot as well yeah mm. and she decides she has to have find homes for her little siblings and the best way to make that transition easy for them is is to this makes no sense but none of these things <laughs> make any sense here just purely to make characters suffer She's like, oh, it'll be too hard for them to leave me unless I make them hate me. So every <laughs> every week she would do something like, if, you know, that would make the little siblings think, but Harriet, don't you want me to be happy? No. <laughs> and oh. she never seemed to think that maybe it'd be worse for them to like think go through that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, maybe she's going to die anyway. Yeah. Like, it's not going to be easier if she rejects them first. So that was kind of a good ongoing thing. There would just be all these who live for drama. <laughs> yeah. There is, they, they really were making the drama like for no reason whatsoever, apart from just to pile on the awfulness so that so, but I used to find that really difficult to read as a kid yeah. were there like noticeable like differences in like team and stuff between them or were they all just like this sets of like stories different like different comics yeah yeah uh, they were all pretty much similar like you would yeah. have in, in each uh, I brought two two issues along so I've got a Judy from 1984 which is sort of my golden period of reading it I was <laughs> November 1984 so I was nine and in it you've got um you know, there's sort of contemporary stories, wheels of misfortune, <laughs> because it's a girl who uses a wheelchair. That is the sensitive disability oh. Oh. awareness. But yeah. she is the heroine, you see. Okay. She's um she isn't she's 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 another person who's like living with evil relatives. Um a story about the fugitives about girls living in a museum among the exhibits. Uh Petra the party maker. It's one of those ones where it's just like every week she organises a different sort of party. They were all quite boring. Um, was that a guide to tights on the page just there? Was there? Oh, yes. You can oh, no, it's buy... an ad for the body shop, is it? Well, there is a body shop competition. Ah. Um, wow. And a sort, of, uh, a sort of an ad. Faye Farrell, army nurse. The two faces of Faye. Now, this was a classic sort of story where it would always be about... It would be about... Everybody thinks so-and-so is really nice. But really, she's, she's evil. evil. Yeah. Oh, that's making no. it a really weird precedent for girls reading it to think about people like if they think they're really nice, and then it's like, well, according to the comics, there's yeah. always the flip of the coin. Yes. where they're like mm. their true selves. Yeah, 
So like this is the description because they would have a sort of, you know, it would be an ongoing thing, but they would be quite episodic, sort of like a, you know, like a lot of ongoing TV series. Mm -hmm. So um, there would be like a little panel with the background info. So Isabel Carter didn't realise that on her 16th birthday she would inherit a large legacy if she still had an unblemished character. However, her greedy cousin Faye, who lived with the Carters, knew of the legacy and also knew that when you would come to her, should Isabel fail to fulfil the conditions of her, the will. So Faye began a secret campaign to get her cousin disgrace. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so there was a lot of, there, that was another really common theme. It would be somebody like... Villainy, like... <laughs> well, well, sort of psychotic villainy and downfall, but it would be somebody being undermined yeah. by, you know, for various reasons. And uh, and this was the, the dodgy message about bullying and things like that, because a lot of the time they would know that they were being either bullied or blackmailed or whatever, and yeah. they they would Framed say... Framed for something. Yeah, but they would be like... But that could tell somebody, but what's the point? No one uh. would believe me. <laughs> it's like the worst possible thing you could say to kids. Yeah. So They've woven the web too complicated yeah. for me to try. So <laughs> like, it was really like in that sense they they sort of tell girls, okay, um, suffering is good. <laughs> um, taking the blame for things that you didn't do <laughs> is good. good There's no point in telling people if somebody's being horrible to you because the only way to get your bully found out in these comics was if your bully conveniently stood next to a microphone backstage <laughs> at yeah. something that you switched on <laughs> and then they would like be gloating over their crimes and then that was then you'd be saved. I'm like the odds of that happening are very slim. Yeah. Very slim. Well, surprisingly high at this <laughs> story. It's usually happened at some stage. At the very end, that would be how they would end. And uh, then the then the villain would just sort of be like, I don't care, I hate you all. But then, you know, <laughs> they would be just, the, our, our heroine would be vindicated. So that that is what it takes, apparently. So, like, were there ever, like, empowering messages? Really? Well, or was it all grim and toxic? And grey. Well, it, it, <laughs> it, were in a way because they actually showed a surprising variety apart from all the sort of masochism and orphans and things yeah. like even in the masochistic stories one story that I liked was called I think it was called To Catch the Cash and it was a girl who was like a heroine in the renaissance or renaissance uh, resistance <laughs> in occupied France oh wow and uh, known as The Cash but to avoid suspicion she has to present herself to her villagers as like a collaborator so they all think that she's really you know, this is part of the whole she's suffering for yeah, yeah. Re- for things she hasn't so done. So they think that she's a Nazi. Yes, but really, she <sighs> is the cat who is saving the entire village. From, it's like you know, Spider-Man. Very similar. She actually yeah. has a similar sort of ensemble, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, because it's like Peter Parker, everyone is, uh, he's like trying to catch Spider-Man and the media paints Spider-Man as it's like vigilante villain. Yeah. And that's actually... Yeah, so that would be... But you know, they trope. did show she was a girl who was... A resistance heroine and then so a lot of them would be you know somebody who's incredibly brave or yeah. is like cool jobs a good variety they of had jobs. a lot of cool jobs I mean there were a lot of things like you know the over representation of nurse yeah. and ballerina mm. but you know one of which is slightly more realistic aspiration than the other but they um, <laughs> ballerina they, school yeah well there were lots at ballerina school which was fine by me frankly but they um, they showed also girls were always the centre of something in them mm. like so there was you know there were a wide variety of stories so they passed the Bechdel test oh yeah they definitely did yeah. I <laughs> mean they weren't hugely racially diverse like every mm. so often they were pretty much 99.9% mm. white there'd be like one friend in a panel that would be black or yes or sometimes there would be a story with a character who wasn't white but it would be about that yes yeah. I remember there was a Bunty story called Please, Mum, where it was a girl from I think a Bangladeshi background, and she wanted to 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 live a liberated life, but her mum was very conservative, so she would say, "Please, Mum," but um, so that was uh, that. I think yeah. it was well-meaning, but mm. you know, um, so they they were certainly not uh, particularly progressive in yeah. many. Yeah, like, and you mentioned the character Peggy. Was it Peggy's face? Penny. Penny's, Penny's face. face. So Penelope. was there were there LGBT oh God. stories? Oh Jesus, God, was, no. it or was it all in subtext? It was <laughs> it's like before Clause no. Twenty Eight, when it was. Bad, I'm just asking questions. All I knew, was, all <laughs> I knew was that Donna was gay because of her hair, okay. and that's me making assumptions because of cultural references that I've projected onto Donna at the age of twenty four. <laughs> but I think there was something there. There, like I think, 
There was anything even romantic was always heterosexual and it was always relatively chaste as well. Oh, it was extremely chaste, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, there were things like Jackie that were aimed at older kids and even... And, and they would have, you know, it's all romance. Yeah. But um, these stories were pretty, pretty innocent uh, mm. all round. Mm. I mean, they, they were mostly read by seven year olds. So and there know. were yeah. more like animal sidekicks than boy yeah. plot points. Like, yeah. Or like girl groups. It was mostly relationships between girls. I mean, mm. that's one of the, the really in- cool, like interesting things. Yeah, that a lot of them, it was all about the dynamic between girls Mm -hmm. so the villains were girls but the heroines were girls Mm. and the sort of allies were girls and the authority figures were usually women yeah female teachers or like a mom or you know evil orphan owner lady yeah (laughs) (laughs) Miss Trunchbull type of orphanage (laughs) mistress orphanage (laughs) mistress yeah (laughs) That's the title. Well, they were obsessed with orphans as well. Mm-hmm. Like, there was a story that... Um, the the be- fetishism there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like- well, there were also... I mean, that's a classic thing in kids' books about... Yeah. Oh, yeah. The parents just get in the way of exactly. stories. Exactly. So, yeah, you're yeah. going to kill them off. Yeah. But um, there was... It's too safe otherwise. Exactly. Mm. But a lot of them were sort of about people helping orphans. So there was Miss Angels, which is one of the... I remember that. Yeah, yeah. that was one of the ongoing ones. So Miss Angel was this... This is another example. She was very pretty. She was. Mm. She... I Sadly, I didn't. I don't have in my... She was blonde, house. wasn't she? She was blonde. And had like a low ponytail. She did, yeah. Mm. And she... She's kind of like Miss Honey from Matilda. <gasps> oh. Yeah. She kind of was. Like very like... Anyway, what was her... Did she just take in kids? Did well, she, what her, her thing, thing was that she also remember. had an unspecified wasting disease as so many of them did <laughs> and decided yeah, did. yeah so she decided another of these misguided things she was like to save my parents the pain of watching me die slowly I want to fake my own death so I think I'm just <laughs> gone for no reason I'm fallen into a crevasse and I think she pretended she drowned anyway yeah. she then goes and opens a shelter in a stable called the Stable House for her waifs and uh, so she runs an orphanage and even as a kid me and my sister would be like why doesn't she just stay in her giant mansion and use all her money to like look <laughs> yeah. after these orphans yeah. but, instead um, of a stable like it's yeah. not fiscally sensible <laughs> not in any way it's extremely impractical especially if you're dying of TB like you'd probably be able to you know work a bit better if you had and a comfortable be warmer, bed you know a lot warmer yeah, yeah. I'm living in a damp gross stable so um, yeah that was she was hugely popular though. like a lot of these people these characters were so popular that they would just bring them back yeah. So they would um they would have them um you know return so they'd have a, a hook or frame for the idea mm. so with Miss Angel it might be um a girl in the modern day has discovered Miss Angel's diary and you know it's like <laughs> what no it's another tale a glimpse, of, mm. a glimpse yeah. into her manky yeah. stable <laughs> So, yeah, that was, um, there was a lot of stories set in orphanages and mm. workhouses. Me and my mm. sister Jenny went through a phase when I was about nine and she was about seven and we would only be persuaded to drink soup if we pretended that it was gruel. <laughs> <laughs> we would, like, I did that too. <laughs> yeah, I used to do it. Like, even with, like, nice, like, tomato soup or whatever, me. I, my sister didn't do it because she'd be like, why would I do that? But I would be like, oh, goodness. This is so <laughs> <laughs> it's so thin. <laughs> sometimes I'd, like... Did you ever like put a blanket around you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to add to the effect. Just be like, oh, it's so cold. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, helped us appreciate yeah, exactly. our soup. Yeah. Well, it was, I savoured every spoonful. Yeah. And, uh, maybe we did learn something. Yeah, I mm. think so. <laughs> so learn to <laughs> appreciate like a tinned soup. A tinned, uh, like a tinned cream of tomato. I mean, mm. it's I solid. think oxtail was the, the most gruel-like. Yeah, because it was thin. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like it looked had, a bit gruelish. Yeah, like you could do this, and it would kind of glop back yeah. into the ball. It didn't look very appetizing no. either. So, um, so they did, you know, they're quite inspirational. You know, you yeah. would, they would trigger your imagination mm-hmm. to mm. to the extent that um, the scary stories, though, they were all like, yeah. It sounds like they covered a lot of genres. They did, it. yeah. Orphans, yeah. <laughs> all the major orphans, kinds. Orphans, more, more, horror, horror, orphans and horror. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the the. The horror stories were kind of nuts because they were all, they tended to be based on the premise that somebody would have some minor character flaw, like being late, uh, for which they would then be punished for all eternity, (laughs) which seems very, like, often by being, you know, trapped in a paperweight or, you know, or a magic mirror. Twilight Zone kind of things, but like more sadistic. It's kind of like Are You Afraid of the Dark as well. There was an episode where, um, this girl went to like art classes and if she used a paintbrush by 
that the teacher gave her she would be trapped in the painting <gasps> that she painted that kind of thing yes very much mm-hmm. it was a lot of people being trapped that was very scary they were extremely mm-hmm. scary and it would often be you know sort of implied that they'd kind of deserved it for doing something <laughs> for you know being oh I spent an, I'm punctual yeah well there was one story that freaked me out when I was a kid it was a photo story as well so it's sort of added to it was in an annual and it's like photo some, stories yeah because it's like that's a real girl I know <laughs> and especially in this case yeah she was always late mm. for a friend she's like who is it when you're 12 like it's not the worst crime in the world no so she's always late and then one day she turns up at the a tube station and uh, to meet her friends for ho- they're going to a Halloween party and she gets into the tube there she sees her friends as she thinks in oh. the carriage I know you're scared already yeah I <laughs> know no. you got me gets worse <laughs> gets worse she goes into the carriage and it's like oh sorry I'm late guys oh you know but it's fine and they're all wearing scary masks and like robes and she's like guys you know I said I was sorry nobody says anything and it ends with the train going into a carriage and her going you are my friends, aren't you? Aren't you? Oh, no, <laughs> and no. that's the end. That's open-ended. That's horrendous. Yeah. I know. That's, that's awful. That I'm actually quite creeped out by that. I'm sorry. Mm. I imagine reading with you for seven. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I'm sure that when you were younger, did you just read a lot of stuff that maybe was for someone like maybe three or four years older? Yes. Just because you were a voracious enough reader. Yes. Like, and yeah. I would freak myself out like... I remember freaking myself out by but reading the. Done that. <laughs> 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 I was like, Why did I do it? I remember reading the backs, like not even the books, the blurbs oh, on yeah. the backs. Oh yeah, Stephen King books. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, my parents' house and sitting at the dinner table later and just thinking and thinking yeah. about what I'd read, which was mm. probably pretty vague because it was just a blurb, and getting so scared I started to cry. Yeah, like, <laughs> you just like think- I used to read Goosebumps, and every time, I would just be like, I I I wanted to, I just wanted to know the ending all the time mm. but like it would lead to me being in, like in bed just like waiting around being like what if my dad turns into a plant or something <laughs> that's the, yeah because the goosebump ones were all actually actually supernatural whereas the point horror ones it was always the nerd oh really point yeah was, I never read point horror read after always seemed times, like they were supernatural pretty... but then weren't oh, that's it was always it was oh. basically Scooby Doo yeah Scooby Doo yeah but that's oh. almost as scary because it's like, wow, real people can commit evil too. Mm. No, I always found supernatural things. They f- I found them scarier. Mm. Scarier. Yeah. And I also, I hate it in books like for adults now where it's, you know, even serious literary fiction where is it supernatural or is it, you know, turn of the screw style? Is it all Mental. in your mind? Mm. And I'm like, I like it better when it's supernatural. Yeah, go ghost yeah. or go home. Just yeah. out of this <laughs> fake cop out. Like you can't no, bring yourself to That's like being like that was a dream. I think that that's the same it thing. It's pretty yeah. much the same thing. Yeah. It's just, it's lazy. You've got to commit to the fucked up it's basically mm. but the scariest story that I read and so not even that scary when you describe it but it scared me so much at the I'd time the context that it was in yes yeah. and I also had a very physical reaction to it which I will explain after okay. I tell the story it was a story about it was in a Diana annual now I don't know if Diana was even a comic but you could you would get find annuals yeah. of it at like sales at work yeah. and things like that was it like from Princess Diana times? No, it was Which pretty, is a historical era early, now. No, it was, it was, it was historical. 83 to 96. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that glorious era yeah. of uh, the Queen of Hearts. Uh, it was, a, um, I think it was actually, possibly this one was from, from Diana's reign. <laughs> and it definitely existed before her. So, um, And it was... What, it didn't even have girls in it this is like they didn't even bother trying to make these things girly yeah. so a family move into a house and they find that there's some garden gnomes mm. in the garden okay straight away oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and the artist I was hoping to find an example of this guy's art because his stuff was incredible probably my favourite comic artist ever and uh, John Byrne who has uh, is a great writer and um, who has done a bunch of uh written a bunch of things on comics of this era actually tracked this guy down because oh, yeah. he was a big fan as well so he's just like some Scottish artist working for DC Thompson like mm. not cool. having the fame he deserves but yeah. he did he was really good doing scary pictures so and they're really just really cool art and the family move in they see these gnomes and um, the minute they, they move away we see the gnomes faces and they're evil <laughs> and things happen in the house I can't remember because I've tried to block the details out of my brain yeah. it's traumatised me too much but one night they come down and the gnomes are in their kitchen and they're like human sized and oh. their faces are terrifying and it, they advance towards them and the next thing it's an estate agent showing another family around the house and they're like <gasps> oh, no. oh the last family disappeared and the newcomers are like what's that are they, are they garden gnomes oh no oh they're not gnomes they're, they're a little family 
And of course, no. it's the family who <laughs> used to live there. And the last picture is of the old family in the sort of gnomish form and their faces are all oh, evil. No. That's like a very specific type of scary story that scares the shit out of me. Me too. Every single time. And yes. A story that ends in locked in syndrome. Yes. Yes. It's Completely. terrifying. That are buried alive. In yeah. Evil gnome yeah. Form. And I was so And it's like you can't tell anyone. I know. You can never yeah. communicate it. Oh my god, it's so <sighs> awful. Well, see, we're all freaked out now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was so scared by this annual that I put it in the bin. I yeah. actually put it in the bin and my mother was like, What are you this is ridiculous? I was like, No, it's gotta get the bin and I could not rest until bin day when I knew it was <laughs> yeah. like I was off the premises. I did that with tarot you- cards that I bought. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I bought them and my mom was like, I don't know, I feel a bit weird about you having them because she sees them as sort of like a Ouija board oh, almost. So I'm like, oh, I don't think so. I was like eight or whatever. Well, and then was pretty young. <laughs> the more I thought about it, I just liked the pictures. Like, yeah. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, this is weird and I don't like them in my room. So I moved them away. But then oh. I was like, now th- I, you could see them like on a heat map. <laughs> so I would be like, oh, they're here. So I need to throw them away. So I put them in the bin. It's really Scared weird when you like assign like your yeah. supernatural <laughs> gifts. Were uh, for I it. was a witch. That's what it was. Uh, yeah, that's I think scary. It's, they were. That was basically typical. Especially for like a like and for kids to be reading. I'm like I'm trying to think. Are there like opportunities now for like eight and nine year old girls to like freak themselves out like that every week or something? I don't know. Like, what do you do now? I don't know. <laughs> like, well, my day you have to make your own fun but I suppose you have to read about the Slender Man on Reddit or something yeah. read Snopes that's what I did yeah. when I got a bit older I just started to read Snopes mm. and like look up um, Google search various like haunted houses and things Unsolved like that Unsolved Mysteries on yeah. Wikipedia oh, yeah. to scare myself yeah. out yeah I couldn't but like I, even though I always liked sort of good horror stuff mm. I, wouldn't d- seek it I wouldn't seek out that sort of urban myth out because mm. that would be the sort of thing where I'd be dismissing it as a rational sensible person yeah. it would be part of my mind the same part of my mind that it threw that gnome's manual yeah. in the bin mm. it's really that primal, would just be like, like ah no yeah. there's certain sorts of creepiness that yeah. I like and then it crosses the line into the things mm. that you you know wake up at four o'clock in the morning trying not to think about yeah yeah so, like you just even telling us about that was bad but like the art sounds like it really made it oh the art that art can you see so it great. like when I can close your eyes. and yeah. it's over 20 years burned and into your brain it's 30 years I think I think it was um, it was like the mid 80s and I'm still traumatised by it and actually a couple of years ago it was in a shop a comic shop in Temple Bar and looking they had a bunch of Diana annuals yeah hmm. and I was there with my husband and uh I was joking to him, like, oh man, imagine if this is the one with the gnomes. And I was opening it, and I, part of me was going, what if I actually is? don't want it <laughs> to be. And I, was, I was too scared to look, yeah. and I was like, oh, thank God, it's not. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there was something very wrong. Um, but a lot of those stories, I don't know about you know individual ones but mm-hmm. they were written by people who went on to like be you know do big things in 2018 and stuff like that so there were people who were sort of masters of uh, yeah. comic fucked upness um, and they sometimes had really amazing kind of power concepts there was one great one that they'd reprint every few years because it was so popular called Little Stranger which I'm now thinking as it comes into my head was possibly a secret influence on Buffy because okay. oh okay because the premise Unless was so we were going to say Sarah Waters but no yeah. well I'd like to think that she, <laughs> she probably read it actually yeah. but um, bear in mind Joss Whedon did go to an English public school in the really? 70, in the 80s yeah okay he went to boarding school in England so um, maybe he did read it but uh, mm. especially you can see there are two elements it's a girl wakes up one day and suddenly every she has a sister who was never there before. <gasps> oh. Dawn. Exactly. Yeah. It's like Buffy <laughs> season five, except in this case, she knows she used to have a sister, but everyone else is like, why are you so jealous of your sister? Oh, what, that's this like is terrible. the same thing as the locked in thing where it's like, you know something is exactly. wrong, yeah. but nobody believes you it's or you can't ha- tell anyone. It's proper horror paranoia. Yeah. Like the basis yeah. of good horror is mm-hmm. the paranoia. Yeah. And uh, like a piece of information only you know that you can't prove. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and everyone's like, they're crazy. You're like, yeah. No. <laughs> and the whole town would just be like, oh, she's so jealous of, si- of her sister. His name was Darla. Okay. Darla. Yeah. Like the evil. Oh, yeah. Like angels. angels Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So. She was, oh. Yeah, she bit him. So, she? Ex- um, so there are. Uh, uh, she was little Darla, the only other 
person ever called Darla. <laughs> <laughs> she um, she was, as it turned out, of course, an alien who had like brainwashed the entire town. But there'd be things like, oh my goodness, my aunt has, has come back from <laughs> you know some foreign country. She'll know I didn't have a sister. And then, of course, the aunt's in a car crash. So, oh, no. so every time you'd think she was going to get some... Some mm. knowledge, uh, you know, some proof that she yeah. wasn't uh, like deluded. Something terrible would happen. Yeah. So they were basically yeah. like, they were, they were so bleak. All of them. That did have a happy ending, but I can't remember what it was. But I mean, that it, reminds me of a TV series called Nowhere Man. Do you remember that? It was only oh. for like one series, and there was oh. no resolution to it. Basically, I woke up one morning and nobody remembered he'd never existed. Ooh. Yeah. So he like went to his parents' house, and his mother was like. No. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah, that's but horrible. but it turned out it was like a conspiracy against him. Like his wife had a new husband and stuff oh. and stuff. Oh. But it was all he'd taken a photo of something he shouldn't have taken a photo of. <gasps> so the government just erased him. That is actually which is also that, horrifying. That's you're, yeah. like, you're like, no, I'm I'm your husband. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And you're my oh, mother. That yeah. Is really creepy. yeah. Have you guys ever read any um, Philippa Pierce stories? No. She was like a kid. Tom's been at garden. Yeah. Oh, I love Tom's been at garden. But she wrote like other. Like she wrote like a short horror stories for kids, and they were really fun. Really, creepy. and it really reminded me of um some of these stories. Like I don't even remember like the names of them, but they were very like eerie and about like there was one that was about like a Christmas pudding, and there was an evil child and he like poisoned his family. Or there was one as well about like a a piece of furniture that was like kind of haunted. And it sounds so stupid because it was just you know like this chest of drawers called the Tall Boy. Mm. Yeah, and it was just called the Tall Boy, and it was one of the scariest things I ever read, and it was. Really, it was you know, you're rationalizing. You're like, this is just wood and stuff, but yeah. it was like it was there was something Sinister. in it, something yeah. bad Ooh. in it. But it just really reminded me because I was like, what did it scare me when I was like that age? That because yeah. when I read Bunty, there were no really scary stories. But that was probably what I used. to Maybe read. they just realized they'd managed to traumatize the entire <laughs> generation. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, we fucked them up. Maybe you better just call it yeah. threats now. Or all the 2008 AD writers have left. Yeah, well, yeah. that's what I think. Is it probably left? I mean, they would have left even by the time I was reading mm. it, but they'd set the tone for the yeah. Next yeah. decade of. It's like, see what these did? They just keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, just add gnomes. stories yeah. for gnomes, <laughs> people being punished for, you know, being five minutes late by going to hell, like the, the usual things. <laughs> oh, that's that one is very scary. Yeah, see, they're all, they're like. I think if I read they them probably now. turned everyone into such high self monitors. <laughs> yeah, like you'd be like, I need to just be make sure everyone's happy all the time, so I don't get kidnapped. On I'm a going train. to be cursed, <laughs> yeah. or you know, trapped in a in a in a in a tall boy. I don't or know, like like in a, one of those little ships in a bottle, like <gasps> living on one of them. Oh my <laughs> god, I will. I don't remember if that ever happened, but I would not be surprised. Yeah, if it did. If that, that is was the it. sort of sadistic. Mm -hmm awfulness that would take place in these stories like a little girl would never help her granddad when he wanted to do them with her she'd be like that's stupid I'm wasting yeah. my time and then it would be like <laughs> one of the one of the uh, the best um, presents I've ever seen anybody get where was one of my best friends received for her birthday so um, back when we were in college another friend had tracked down an annual with one of the most awful of those scary stories and had made wrapping paper out of it oh <laughs> so when she opened it was just like hang on <laughs> no no that's so mean it's great though yeah mm -hmm. it is pretty inspired so um yeah that's like that's the thing it really wasn't just me it was everybody i know who mm. read them was um there's a collective disturbed yeah. by yeah. her life but i think it's really i don't know i i would not want any children i know to, to be, be reading them to be traumatized really? see I, I would think i don't know if i would i think i wouldn't mind them reading it if they were forewarned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I suppose the fact that kids like being scared. Like, I mm -hmm. was really scared of bits of Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator when I was a kid. Yeah, no, that was... Didn't mm. like the elevator zooming up at all. It and was I, very, like, lack of control. Yes. Of mm. Yeah. I seemed kind of nightmarish. Yeah. So, I mean... A lot of the world all stuff was a little bit like that. Oh, the witches yes. is terrifying. Yeah. Well, the, the witch... witch I've never read, 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 read... I've never read anything scarier than the witches. Yeah. And the, this, when they're hiding during the big meeting. Yeah. yeah. That's just the most tense thing or even and the description yeah. of how a witch hides their, her witchy oh yeah. the, the pictures the, I can see yeah, yeah. 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 Quentin Blake is so good like mm. but I'm but the pic the end of the witches was another example that was the first time oh yeah I remember mm. the first time I read it which was around the time it came out I think it was really lucky that the 80s were the time when I was getting new Roald Dahls that's like, amazing you know, it was yeah. like the last it was the last generation we may have been traumatised by comics but we got yeah, new Roald Dahls over <laughs> yeah. the years but the um 
the end of it, I remember thinking, okay, like there's only a few pages left, so he's going to have to be turned back into a human yeah. because he has been to anyone yeah. who hasn't read it turned into a mouse. Yeah. And you're just like, well, hang on, there's only two pages left. Oh, there's only what? He's, what? Yeah. No. It's like, oh, you're going to be an old mouse and die at the same time as your grandma. Like, that's not a happy ending. No. It's mm. terrible. And then you're kind of like, wow, that's just life, isn't it? Sometimes things don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, maybe that's what kids' books kind yeah. of have to do mm. sometimes. Like, there is some stuff that I think it's good. Like, I enjoyed being scared. And, like, me and my friend that I've known since I was, like, three or four, like, she would know lots of scary stories because she had two older brothers. So there is, like, a fun in it. But, um... There is also a thing where you're like, I wonder if there anything that's made me afraid of stuff now yeah. because mm. of what I consumed. I am scared of gnomes. <laughs> so it's yeah, no. Slinger. But I didn't like, her, like I would always, if I was going to a slumber party or something, mm -hmm. I would be genuinely really scared in advance that somebody, really worried be in like advance scary stories. that somebody would want either scary stories or like to put on Nightmare on Elm Street or something that they had mm. swiped from their big brother. Yeah. Or, or like try and do a seance or something. Oh God, yeah, no, anything like that. <laughs> that was me. I was like, guys, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, some other kids in the I, think, I think I think we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> we're eight now. It's time. I never did a Ouija board though. We're coming into our powers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, oh, the Ouija board would have just freaked me out. No, my mom was always like, "Don't you dare do anything, but don't do a Ouija board." I think there was sort of this idea, and it, like it was quite mainstream that people would say, you know, parents mm. and Bad teachers would be like, happen. "Yeah, yeah like, yeah, like you don't dabble." Like, don't yeah. dabble in it. Don't dabble in the occult. Get right in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you know, commit yourself. Yeah, there was actually like a big, like, widespread cultural Ouija board thing in like the mid 90s, wasn't there? Yeah. Just, it's because it became, okay, there must like, have been something. A there film was a Ouija board sort. and then a toy bus fell over and then someone got hit by a bus. Then I said, like, yeah. they, those stories were going around for a while. And mm. you would, there'd be a part of you that would be like, well, it cautious. might be true. I'm not going to yeah. take a risk <laughs> yeah. by, you know, summoning up something. Do you think there's anything seven. good from the girl comics that you have like retained, or like what have you? What are your good memories about reading them? Um, well, like just they were genuinely enormously entertaining. Mm -hmm. Like you can't pretend that they weren't. Like they were, mm. you know, they were sometimes like there was a story called this wasn't even one of the best ones, but it's an example of the sheer weirdness called the flights of floppier, where somebody a girl uh, traveled around in a space a TARDIS like spaceship that was a giant sentient talking rabbit. So, and that was... Okay. Yep. That's, that's <laughs> what you have me. Yeah, okay. yeah. it was... Uh, those were the sort of, um, you know, one of the male <laughs> adventures uh, outside the crazy, death, deadly horror stories. Yeah. Like, you have but, to kind of imagine, like, all those writers, the ones like the orphanage ones and the sentient space rabbit ones in the same pitch meeting going, yeah. I've got this uh, girl yeah. from Harriet. She lives in an orphanage. She... Um, she rescues one of her friends from being trapped in a cupboard and the other person's like, I have this rabbit. <laughs> it can travel through time and a girl lives inside it. <laughs> and like, is floppier. We're going to go with both of them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah. Got the Great mix. ideas. Yeah. You've got the mix right there. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, they were kind, it was kind of mad, but the artwork was also, um, I think one of my, my favourite illustrators, which I'm going to, to listeners, I'm going to show to um, Alan and Ellen. I loved that illustration. That actually looks my like favorite, but they had it's like Chris Ware. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Like some of them were just the artwork was um, re just really good comics. Much right? better, yeah. than, much better than it needs to be. Yeah, for seven year olds. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And there were um, like a lot of them. The uh, the artwork was was kind of incredible. Mm. And Compare them to like if you look at the girl comics, and then if you look at something like the dandy or the beetle, the backgrounds are never as detailed. Or oh yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Like look at the this was another this was the illustrator who did Little Stranger. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I lo this was uh, I loved this illustrator as well. I actually and recognize that style. Really yeah, cool. yeah. And it's nice because it's like just one color, so it's all mm. they did a lot of tonal. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So they were really kind of graphically imaginative mm -hmm. and I think it is one of the reasons why I got really into you know that I still do love comics and graphic novels um, was because I got this grounding in reading yeah. comics mm. when you know I was five and uh, yeah. and just kept reading them so I, I just and I would do my own when I was a kid so they are basically a kind of you know, the idea is still kind of prevalent surprisingly prevalent that comics I mean it's changed a bit but the comics are very male preserve yeah and i remember i go into forbidden planet just to get like the latest issue of mm. sandman or whatever in the mid 90s i would literally be the only girl yeah. in there and um even though there were plenty of girls who mm. read comics but the comic book shops were not 
you don't feel friendly. really you didn't feel welcome no you felt like yeah. a giant like you had a neon sign on your head when you went in and um but i i, I think that you know these comics just show the girls really loved the yeah. medium yeah, it's yeah. kind of it happens a lot where something will belong to girls and then later on boys will get into it and just take it over because yeah. like the Dan Dare and Ryder Over things nobody read those that I knew yeah. there was a couple of annuals in our school library but they were really boring they were yeah. boring they were just all a soldier in fighting Nazis I remember one which ended with an Iron Cross falling on a Nazi and killing oh. him that's the only image I remember from any of them <laughs> but nobody read them yeah. and then they get older and go oh comics and then they just completely take over and yeah. say Remember the shut out girls. like everyone in my like around the mid two thousands when I was like a t- like when I was like an early teenager it was like anime was huge and then people read manga a lot and it was like there was just a huge like influx of like Japanese art and mm. stuff and that collided with like emo and like there was just a lot of stuff going on. So I think a lot of people that I know that like comics and stuff now, their interest in it would have started from like not really from like the B and stuff, but it would be from stuff like Battle Royale, mm. or like. Well, manga did have a huge t- mm-hmm. like may it you know widened comics readership and a lot of girls as, as well. Yeah, read. two mm-hmm. girls. Yeah, mm-hmm. because a lot of girls who might have been put off some of you know mainstream mm. like um, Marvel and DC comics, yeah. which you know are not. They're really alienating. Yeah, I'd they ima- are, I would yeah. imagine. Never yeah, I never read them either. Yeah. Neither did I. And yeah. I mean, there are there's an amazing. Um, Ms. Marvel now by G. Willow Will, uh, yeah. Wilson, which is fantastic. Um, where Ms. Uh, Marvel is a young uh, American Pakistani girl, and they're really funny and brilliant. Um, mm. but I would never, you know, they wouldn't be something I would go for. Yeah. yeah. The um, the the independent comics have always been a lot more female friendly, and I think manga, you know, brought in a lot of girls yeah. as a well. A lot of people that I know that would. Have they would have gotten in or yeah. like fruits basket or something and then they would like read that and then read more comics and stuff what's like that gateway drug fruits basket was an anime a, and a manga and i there was a part of time where i tried to kind of get into manga but I, I wasn't really for me like i read two really different series i read like tokyo Mew, Mew which is like shoujo manga which is like four girls really girly about like these like four girl animal hybrids or something it was really good i read it in, like second year of school so i don't remember much about it mm. and then Battle Royale was like really graphic and like eighteen yeah. plus, yeah. and I was like fourteen reading it. it but I'm um, the, yeah, the Battle Royale manga is it's gra- it's I read graphic. that yeah, yeah yeah I've read a couple of them yeah they are very graphic. I've but only read probably the first one, mm. but yeah, yeah it is. But like I know a few people that are involved in comics and stuff now, and it all start, kind of started from manga. But I it's weird because Bunty and stuff for me I would never have thought of as a comic because I'd be like there was more photo stories in it by the time yeah. I was reading it, mm. so it was like a magazine with comics in it. Yeah. Whereas these are like purely just strips, yeah. like mm. which is really cool. Yeah, and I think because there is a really wide variety of pictures, and, you know, of mm. artwork in them, the styles are so different. Yeah, so there's it sort of exposes you to different sort of forms of comic. Yeah, you kind of learn the visual language. Exactly, and there, you know, there's a, a huge variety. It's kind of bizarre variety of topics. Mm. Um, Even the title fonts are so different. Yeah, I know. that's like tattoo back there. Like old fashioned slash tattoos. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I always really liked that artist as well. But they they had you know there was they were really eclectic. So they kind mm. of exposed you would have favorite artists and you mm-hmm. you know some of the stories obviously looked way better yeah. than others. Mm. But they um, they did kind of like they were I found them really inspirational. I used to do mm. my own comics all the time. So did my sisters. Do you remember any of them? Um, I still have quite a I had a, quite a con- continuous one of one called. <laughs> Minty, which is very <laughs> nice <Minty's> name, <laughs> and uh, yeah, do you know like four sheets of paper? Yeah, well, actually, you no, know, two sheets folded over, so it would like, be like copy size. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So it'd be like, but like an A4 sheet, yeah, folded over, mm. and um, you know, you'd have continuing stories and mm. letters page and like yeah, I used to put in ads yeah. and stuff. Mm. So, um, like it would, I think it's still. What I would still, what I would love to do now is to do comics because I kept, I always kept drawing, mm. and it is still my kind of secret dream. So, because I'm a frustrated illustrator who failed <laughs> to get into art college, so um, that was that you know was all triggered by the yeah, craziness. Like they, they got you creating, exactly. And then 
You, yeah. kind of, you kept going then. You did the zines and you were abandoned. Yeah, but I, yeah. I you know, maybe I would never have done any of this if it weren't yeah. for Judy and Maddie. But they were also my first thing of having a magazine or something that came out every week. Yeah. You'd always get it. Mm. And it's a nice way to measure out time. Like Yeah, it was Wednesdays. Mm. Wednesdays yeah. was comic day. Mm. And we would get them um, reserved for us in our local news agents. So like they come with, you know, Carrie written on the yeah. corner. Um, but, you know, they would get like for you know even as I said earlier when we were if you were technically too old to read them I mean even my dad would sometimes find yeah. them <laughs> at the at the table reading Penny's place uh, it it was um, they were it was just hard not to keep reading mm. them and I think because you know they uh, they they did have such a like they kept going for so long mm. that um, I think they just sort of wormed their way into they were they were a big part of my kind of pop cultural childhood yeah um, because they uh, like if I st- to this day if I see a old girls annual in a sale of work or a charity shop or you whatever I will yeah. Buy yeah. It, like absolutely yeah 100% I will not even consider it so it's mm. like oh <gasps> um, and there's still quite a lot of them in my in my parents house which uh, I've now feel the need to <laughs> take out so <laughs> I'm torment myself with tales of orphans <laughs> and such like so is there anything like now for kids that age or girls that age there are a lot of sort of magazines but mm. you know I wouldn't have any reason I don't uh, have any small female relatives who are yeah. the right age for them so but just the impression I get is they just seem a lot more sort of celebrity orientation mm. or maybe they have pictures of animals and stuff which they they did once they became full colour the man yeah. and Judy and such like they would have you know, a it's poster a picture of a horse of, yes exactly <laughs> or a puppy yeah. Yeah. Um, so they have that there's a lot of free gifts and celebrities but there's nothing yeah. story based as it far seems as like I can just tell. 17 junior is the yeah. kind of yeah, yeah, model exactly. now yeah. um, but you know there's this big tradition of like girls media and people do rightly criticise a lot of media aimed at women but at the same time they form they create this kind of ongoing kind of semi-reflection of yourself I mean it's not always a good thing but no. it's you know the fact that they're they are part of female culture mm-hmm. and it kind of annoys me when they get dismissed yeah uh, even if they're not always like a positive influence because they're kind of a bedrock for everybody yeah exactly yeah. and they're you know they do show at least con- attitudes towards girls and, yeah. and by girls and what girls are into yeah like even if you you like I remember reading magazines and stuff and like looking back I'm like that was weird but like so much of my life was like not like probably in- influenced by them like I used to like read them and like try and write like articles in the style of like how like smash hits would write about yeah. somebody and stuff mm-hmm. And like you don't really realize until you're older that like so much stuff is informed, especially if you're a heavy reader. When yeah, you're younger. Mm. but that's how you learn. I mean, I whenever I, if I talk to people about journalism, like I don't, I did a master's in journalism, which was completely useless. Apart from like I did not learn mm-hmm. anything practical really, because the only practical, the only point of that master's, which is just completely unfair to the wider world was yeah. that it got me a work placement and mm. um, mm-hmm. that was literally the entire point of it so that yeah. is you know uh, the point of doing a year um, I learned more just writing for my student newspaper as an undergraduate um, and uh, doing you know German and history of art and I learned by reading and that is what you mm. know I learned by reading a lot of magazines and reading a lot of comics mm. and that is how you learn and actually smash hits like smash hits in the 80s which is the funny I, I strongly recommend anybody reading Sylvia Patterson's amazing book I'm not with the band that just came okay. out a few mm. months ago um, and she was writing for smash hits in the late 80s when it was just the most deranged hilarious magazine in the world and it kind of showed me oh my god this is what this you can be this funny like yeah. things can mm. be this funny you could write this really you know like a survey yeah surreal mm. way and people will like it like Smash Hits was selling over a million copies a fortnight in 1988 and and it was incredibly weird like it's it would like mm. you know Pop World with Simon Amstel yeah. Pop World is it's, basically Smash it's Hits it's really yeah. influenced by that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the same like Lamar from Afar yes <laughs> <laughs> oh man I loved Pop World that yeah me too that Simon gl- Amstel and Nikita Nikita all yeah. Her. Yeah. the pair of them were just amazing and it was exactly the same as Spirit mm. As Vashits, mm. that um, uh, which was 
just incredibly funny and expected readers to get it. Yeah. And they did get it. I mm. think it was sort of a lesson in how to respect your readership. You know, they will rise up to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the thing that that is how, you know, cons- you know, if you want people to, if you want to be able to write, you got to, you have to read. Yeah. Mm. And if you have stuff that's sort of aimed at you and that takes you seriously and that wants to entertain you and isn't sort of talking down to you, um, so you're going to read it all like. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. and and it's really good for you I think as a yeah. as a reader and a writer <laughs> it's, it's good for both both aspects so I think it does kind of um, you know the, the, the wider kids read as well the better so you know I don't know of having a solid diet of Judy and Tracy mm-hmm. would have been hugely healthy but you know um, I'm I'm always wary about people dismissing anything as being kind of just fluff or Mm -hmm. trash or Mm. whatever because trashy things have their purpose. Yeah, exactly. I don't think you should just like have a hierarchy of things being like objectively good because everyone likes something for a reason. Mm. (laughs) And also in every genre has good stuff in it. Mm. Yeah. So, um, you know, it always annoys me people having any sort of genre snobbery because... Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I read this is completely off topic, but I remember when I read um, "Lonesome Dove" by Larry McMurtry, which uh, I don't suppose either of you have read it. No. Nope. Or seen the miniseries starring um, Tommy Lee Jones. No. But no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's an Angelica Houston. But anyway, it's this big. What the Pulitzer Prize? It's a, but it's a western. Like it is a western with cowboys mm. driving cows. I don't know if they're driving horses, but anyway, they are cowboys. And I read it when I was seventeen, and like was. The entire time I read it, I kept thinking every so often, I can't believe I'm reading a Western. Like, how is this happening? But I can't stop. (laughs) (laughs) I cried at the end. And uh, I think that was sort of a lesson that, Mm. like, every genre, whether it is bizarre comics (laughs) or, you know, bizarre comics, kind of amazing art in them. Westerns, even if you think you don't like Westerns, can be incredible and moving and funny and sad. And uh, you can't shut your... Shut your eyes to, or your ears, or you miss out on stuff. Exactly, mm. and through pointless snobbery, and you bore people. At parties. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. I probably managed to bore people at uh, parties, telling them why something is genuinely really good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, that's actually true. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Listen to me. This is me talking about Buffy from like 1997 to 2003. <laughs> it was like seriously, it is good. So uh, yeah, there's danger of that too. <laughs> I think that's a good place to leave it. Yeah. Well, thank you very thank much for having me. Thank you so much. It was brilliant. Um, yeah, it was great. Everybody, go buy Anna's book, The Making of Molly, on October 17th, because it, it's going to be great. Oh, of course it is. You. Well, I hope. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you, Anna. Thank you, Alan. And thank goodbye, you. everybody. Bye. And that's the podcast. Um, thank you to Alan Tannum, my co-host and father. Thank you to Anna Carey, whose book, The Making of Molly, is out October 17th. It's going to be great. And also, the cover is amazing. So even if you don't read books, and I... I mean, that's possible you might not that's okay despite because it would look nice on your shelf but also it's great so do read it um, thank you to Dean McDonald for doing the artwork because we love the artwork um, thank you to Headstuff for hosting us as always uh, we have stickers well, I, nobody seems interested in the stickers but they're really nice stickers because it's just yeah come on you guys ask me for a sticker I'll give you a sticker um, go listen to another Headstuff podcast and uh, oh, Heads of Patreon. Yeah, go support that if you want. Like a euro a month would make a huge difference. It'd be great. And subscribe and review and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher and all the other things. I don't know what I was doing there. I've finished it now. Okay, bye. This has been a production of the Headstuff Podcast Network. <laughs> <laughs>